Hey, it's the second week of our sermon series on Habakkuk. We're talking about living in hard times. You know, the book of Habakkuk is one of my favorite books. In fact, my life verse, Habakkuk 3.19, is just awesome. The Lord God is my strength. That's what that verse says. And certainly in hard times, we need to find a good source of strength, don't we? No, I'm uh, amazed that uh, last year when I was planning the sermon series, you know, here we are, <clears throat> we're getting into this election business and the coronavirus and the economy. I mean, it's just been hard lately. Add to that just the normal everyday relationship problems that people have and just the junk of life. Life can be hard, even in the best of times. And so uh, people have been under a lot of stress. I'm so glad that Habakkuk helps me to understand how to respond in hard times. Last week, we learned that, you know, you can ask God some tough questions in hard times and that he has an answer, you know, that God is going to be at work in our lives. This week, we're going to look at the uh, question, remaining faithful in hard times. How do you do that? How do you remain faithful in, in hard times? Well, in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, uh, the Lord answers Habakkuk. So at the end of chapter one, Habakkuk had heard God's plan and he wasn't really sold out for it, to be honest. He kind of thought that God was, I don't know, acting in a way contrary to what Habakkuk perceived was the right way to go. And I guess that happens sometimes. We have in our mind what we think what will happen next, and then God does something else. And so uh, in the beginning of chapter two, Habakkuk is up in this tower and he's waiting to hear from God uh, about uh, his criticism of God's plan. Okay, so here's how God answers. Then the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets. So he's going to write it down. In fact, we have the book of Habakkuk, so obviously he did write it down. Write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place, and it will not be delayed. You know, God's on a timetable. With the nation of Israel, he was on a timetable. With Habakkuk, he had some times and seasons in mind. In my life and in your life, God acts when and how he wants. And what this verse reminds me is he's never a day early, never late. He's always on time. Maybe from my perspective, it doesn't seem like that. But one part of acting faithfully in hard times is to recognize that God is at work, that his vision and his purpose for our lives are coming to fruition. And we can depend on that. We can trust him in that. Hey, remaining faithful means living by faith in God. So this is Habakkuk 2.4, super famous verse. It's quoted in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, in the book of Galatians, in the book of Hebrews. You find that these New Testament writers found encouragement and uh, meaning in Habakkuk's uh, writing and what God said to Habakkuk. So in these hard times, uh, here's what God said. He's, he's going to make kind of a, a bullet list of some things uh, that need to be improved in the nation of Israel, things that can be improved in my life. And basically, the bullet list has to do with the difference bet between being prideful, being proud and strong on your own, or being trusting and faithful and leaning into God's strength. So here's what he says. Look at the proud. Look at them. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked. But the righteous, see, you see the contrast? People who are prideful, their lives are not straight. They're kind of crooked. <laughs> Sometimes their decisions are self-serving, and they don't have all the information, and they just go with their gut and it can really lead to trouble. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness in God. The righteous 
shall live by faith. Very different than the life guided by pride, by self-interest, and by really pushing God away. Now, as chapter 2 develops, God is going to be like super practical. He's going to say to Habakkuk, this is kind of what a faithful life and a prideful life, this is the differences. He's going to He's going to uh, mark out for Habakkuk and for us uh, some areas where we can see a pride creeping in and some ways in which we might, you know, push God away. Uh, but remaining faithful requires good stewardship of God's resources. Basically, when Adam and Eve arrived on planet Earth, God gave them this beautiful garden and he said, hey, it's your job to take care of it. Everything we have, they're gifts from God, the sunrise, nature, our energy, our time, everything that we have, they're all gifts from God. And how a prideful person is a steward or caretaker of the things of life is very different, God's going to tell her back, very different than how a person of faith handles things. And he talks about these four different areas, wealth, security, work, and nature in chapter two. We won't go over every verse, and I really encourage you to, uh, to read the chapter for yourself. It's a, super, it's a great chapter. It goes into some pretty big detail about what it means to be prideful versus faithful. So let's look at the, uh, the first one, and it is wealth. Back at chapter two, verse five. Wealth is treacherous. When I think of treacherous, you know, I think of like uh, mountain climbing on the edge of a cliff. That's treacherous. White water rafting. Uh, cat, you know, category five hurricane. Uh, those are treacherous things. Uh, being a circus performer on the, the high wire, trying to balance without a net. That sounds, that's pretty treacherous. I don't normally think of wealth as being dangerous. In fact, in our society, wealth is something that people pursue. It's something they chase after. But what God tells Habakkuk is that in, the, in the, these days that they were facing, wealth um, was being misused, and it was no longer a sign of righteousness. People in that day thought that being wealthy meant that God was on your side. But, but Jesus knows that's not the case. He talked about how the pursuit of, of mammon or the pursuit of wealth, unbridled greed, it's, it's the root of all evil. Wealth is treacherous, God told Habakkuk, and the arrogant are never at rest. And so the next several verses go into pretty big detail about how uh, Israel had mistreated their neighbors and friends and others, and how they got into debt, and how that their wealth was all about uh, building um, in evil ways, self-centered ways. Uh, their their gifts that God had entrusted to them were just serving themselves, and they weren't serving others, and so it was treacherous. So that's a sign of pride when you spend all your money on yourself and never never give to others, never invest in worthwhile causes, um, then that's a sign of pride. It's, it's not righteous living. Security, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 9. What sorrow awaits you who build big houses with money gained dishonestly? You can see this kind of spills over from that wealth discussion. You know, the dishonest money, they got these great big houses. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus tells the story of this man who just builds bigger barns to store all of his things, thinking that it would all be safe. He says, you believe wealth will buy security. I mean, there's all these security companies, ADT and the ring doorbell and all those things that people have. And on a practical level, yeah, it builds some measure of security. Uh, but it's not ultimate security. You believe your wealth will buy security, putting your family's nest beyond the reach of danger. 
But God is going to show the Israelites with the this army of Babylonians, this vicious and cruel people will come and dominate them and carry them off into captivity, that all the wealth will come to nothing. All the gates, the walls, the, the big houses, everything they were trusting in to keep them safe, instead of trusting in God. See, their, their problem was they were just trusting in themselves constantly. They looked to themselves for security, not to their faith in God. Um, and it's just not going to work out good for them. So uh, wealth was a sign of their pride. Their self-serving security was a sign of pride. Even their work was coming to nothing. Has not the Lord of heaven's armies promised that the wealth of nations will turn to ashes? They work so hard. Gosh, people work hard. But all in vain. You know, there's a, there's a kind of work that's just spinning your wheels. There's a kind of of chasing uh, after uh, promotions and a better job and a bigger house and a newer car. And even in Habakkuk's day, there was this sense that it just was all in vain. And then there's this really interesting discussion. And I say interesting because it surprised me when I really looked at it. You know, uh, we're told in the book of Genesis at the very beginning that God, you know, populated the earth with the seas and with trees and with the animals. And we're to be caretakers of nature, caretakers of uh, the ecology. And they had done a lousy job. The, the Israelites had forgotten that they were caretakers and stewards of God's good green earth. So in verse 14, he reminds them that even the seas will be filled with the glory of God. So the waters, the waters got it right. You know, the waves crashing on the shore, declaring the glory of God. But uh, in verse 17, Habakkuk is told from the Lord, you guys cut down all the force of Lebanon. Why? For the big houses, for this runaway wealth they were pursuing. They uh, mis mismanaged and misused the forests, and uh, it caused them problems. You destroyed all the wild animals. Of course, they, when you destroy an animal's habitat, you destroy the animal. Now, uh, even today, we have discussions about you know, the forests in uh, the Amazon, or even here in America, what to do about national forest lands and maybe drilling for uh, oil or, or building like diamond mines or something in Alaska. There's this tension between managing, you know, nature and the ecology uh, with the need for human beings to advance our economy and civilization. This is a warning that God gave to Habakkuk, and I think we could hear this today too, that there needs to be a balance to that, that God's called us to be good stewards of our planet. And, you know, with all the political crazy ideas aside, uh, you can be a good steward uh, without uh, ruining other things. It takes balance, and we need to hear the Lord and hear what Habakkuk is told. You know, don't burn down all the forests and kill all the animals, dummy. <laughs> you know, it's important to be a faithful steward of God's uh, good green, green earth. Okay. Uh, here we get into a little bit of trouble in verse 18. Uh, what good is an idol carved by these trees that they cut down or a cast image that deceives you. So instead of pursuing a relationship with a God who created them and loved them, they created all these idols and they worshiped these wooden and bronze idols. How foolish to trust in your own creation, a God that can't even talk. What was their big problem? They weren't satisfied with God's creation and his plan. 
And so they were determined to replace it with their own. Uh, chapter 2 of Habakkuk lays out in pretty clear terms that the nation that was supposed to be sold out for God was in fact sold out for themselves. They weren't pursuing God and obeying him. It was all about me and mine and what I can accomplish and my strength. And that's going to bring the nation to crushing failure. And yes, that is a word for today. When we talk about how strong and powerful and, and what a tremendous uh, nation that we have uh, without thinking about God's uh, clear call for us to be obedient to him, then we could be headed down a wrong path. Remaining faithful means that we will revere the holiness of God. Uh, one of the funny things about this chapter is they made these little idols that couldn't talk. Right? They made these little, little wooden figures and bronze figures that they could set on the mantle and that would be their God, and they could go and they could talk to the idol. Right? They could complain to the idol. And so the, the man, the person, did all the talking. And God says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. They had it completely backwards. With their idolatry, man was doing all the talking, and their gods were silent. And in fact, God would switch it. God would say, why don't you be quiet for a while? Why don't you be silent before me and hear what I have to say? Remember, Habakkuk was complaining. He was worried about God's plans. He, he wanted God to act, and he called out to God. And at this point, God says to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, why don't you just be quiet and be in my presence for a while? Boy, that's, that's a good word for us today. To be quiet before an awesome and wonderful, powerful, majestic God. Just to be in his presence and to hear from him. Man, we need that as a people, as a nation, as a church, our families, our businesses, our friends. Uh, maybe we just need to be quiet before the Lord from time to time. Here's the main point. And I want to give a shout out to my friend Matthew, who's been helping me get these messages together. And these are his words, and I thought they were just great. Difficult times tend to push us to either greater pride or greater faith. Boy, isn't that true? When crunch time comes, who we really are, what God is really doing in our life really comes to the front. Do we, do we run to our own strength or do we run to God's strength in a deeper, greater faith? Here's the prayer for today. Let me just uh, read the prayer first and then we'll bow our heads together. I suggest we finish praying like this. Oh God, you're a great and awesome God. We yield to you. We bend to your power and majesty. You are everything. In our hard times, help us to push toward a greater faith in Jesus' name. Man, that's, that really tells it like it is. It's all about him, and it's not about us. Let's pray. Dear God, you are a great and awesome Lord. We yield to you. We bend to your power and majesty. You are everything. In our hard times, help us to push toward a greater faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you'd like to take a moment to fill out the uh evaluation or the response form below. Just tell us what you thought about the service today. If you have a prayer request, you can share it, question anything, and just hope you have a great weekend and that the Lord does good things in your life.